I'm Mark Golub, and a continuing troubling story in the news is the decision taken by the American Studies Association to institute an academic boycott of the State of Israel. And if you were with us on a prior in the news, you already have heard a professor at Stanford University, Dr. David Palumbo Liu, explain why he does in fact support the ASA boycott and how he tries to circumscribe what it's meant to do. And, and in many ways, you heard somebody who did not seem to be terribly anti-Semitic. Not he was not anti-Semitic. I don't feel he was anti-Israel in his articulation. But he has been definitely influenced by those who see Israel in the Israeli-Palestinian struggle as some kind of bad guy who is imposing or is restricting academic freedoms of the Palestinians on the West Bank. And one of the things that was interesting, and again, if you heard that conversation, you heard me mention this at the end of my conversation with uh, Professor Palumbo Lu, was that he declined to be on with anyone who took a, an opposing position. And if you're familiar with Shalom TV, you see that many times when we have a, a controversial issue, we do our best to have both sides represented at the same table so they can speak with one another. And I was in the position, obviously, I do not agree with the ASA boycott. It is very troubling to me, both as a symbol and in detail in terms of what it actually does in the academic world and on the in the academic culture, which is important here in America as it is throughout Europe and it is in the Middle East. And so, yes, I was somebody who tried to ask the questions that I think many of you would have asked if you were in a room with Professor Palumbo Lu. But right now, I have the great pleasure of speaking with somebody who I, whom I wish could have been part of the discussion. He is somebody you have heard often on Shalom TV. He is a dear, a dear friend, a wonderful voice and a wonderful presence on the world Jewish stage. And I'm talking, of course, about... Professor Charles Small, who is the founder and executive director of ISGAP, the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy. And uh, Charles is in Israel right now, and he's joining us by phone. Charles, thank you so much for being with us again on Shalom TV. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you again. Thanks for having me. Charles, again, I wish you'd been part of the discussion because I would have liked to have heard what you would have said to uh, David, to Professor Palumbo Lu, Both of you are at Stanford. Uh, ISGAP has a home at, St at Stanford, and he is a professor in human and humanities department. He's really dealing with Chinese studies. But he tried to explain that what the ASA was doing was creating a somewhat symbolic, but a, a boycott on an institutional level, that individual professors still had the ability to interact with Israeli professors, that Israeli professors were still going to be invited to come and speak in the institutions, and that one could do collaborative papers with them, but that the ASA was trying to make a statement about what they felt was a serious flaw, defect, an evil of Israeli public policy when it comes to the academic world, and that therefore it was appropriate for the ASA to join, and it formally is now joining, the BDS movement, and everybody in our audience should know, it stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction, in an attempt to delegitimize the State of Israel. So my first question for you in general is, you who are fighting the fight in the halls of academia, what do you say to the ASA in general, and what might you have said to David Palumbo Wu if you were in the discussion with him at that time? Right. Well, so first of all, I hope we at ISGAP, at the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy, we're trying to fight the battle of ideas in the classroom, not in the hallways and not in the corridors, but in the classroom. And I, I have to say the fact that Professor David Palumbo Lau would not appear on your show with another scholar, another professor, even at Stanford, even a colleague who would debate him, is typical, and I find it 
staggeringly frightening that an intellectual would not engage with an, with somebody with a different opinion and would only appear on your show without appearing with somebody with a different perspective. And sadly, and I think alarmingly, alarmingly, this is the culture of silencing and marginalizing not just Israelis and not just Jews, but scholars who have different perspectives than those who want to engage in the dehumanization and the delegitimization and the demonization of Israel and of Jews and Jewish students who have obviously a very strong and profound connection to the land and to the state of Israel. And the fact that in 2014, a scholar from an eminently highly qualified university would not engage in a debate in the United States of America on your show is reflective of this reactionary anti-intellectual movement which is beginning to infringe on basic American values. Charles, when you hear me say that in my conversation with David Palumbo Lu, I did not have the sense that he was anti-Israel or anti-Semitic, but what I said was I felt he had been seduced. That sort of a lovely guy who was for you know, certain kind of values in general was seduced into thinking that the state of Israel was guilty of a kind of anti-academic, anti-Palestinian uh, uh, position that denied Palestinians the academic freedom, which he, as a Stanford academician, is in favor of. I, I think you're 100% right. I was so disappointed that he did not, was not willing to appear with you. And we asked you, and our audience should know, that we asked Charles if he would appear with David. Charles said, absolutely. And David said, no, he would only appear if I had him on alone. It is to me, it is one of the failings at the moment of the academic context and the academic process. But when you hear me say, Charles, I don't think he's anti-Semitic or anti-Israel, do you feel that there is room for my analysis that some of the people who would join in the ASA academic boycott of Israel are doing so not out of an animus towards Jews in general, but because I use the word seduced. They've been seduced into thinking that there really is an issue that is unfairly portrayed by those in the BDS movement. So I, would say, I would say respectfully to you, Rabbi Golub, that um, you know, I, I think the fact that you think he's a nice guy is, uh, you know, I say respectfully to you, irrelevant. He could be a very nice guy. So we've learned from history, and I'm reminded of the writings of um, people who, who uh, came after the Holocaust, and we, we people like Horkheimer and Ardarno uh, wrote about the banality of evil. People who do evil could be nice people. They could be good friends. They could be good brothers and sisters, good members of families, good members of community. And people did their, their, their evil deeds, if you will, and they went home and they lived a normal life. And the fact that in 2014 a scholar would not appear, appear on, a, on Shalom TV, on a Jewish community uh, TV station, with another scholar to, to, to debate an idea in the United States of America, to me, is staggering. And it is a form of evil. And there is a dehumanization and a demonization taking place of Israel. And we need to understand that this is anti-Semitism. This is a, a banal form of anti-Semitism. People don't have to scream and yell about, uh, pardon my language, about dirty Jews or to kill Jews. But they are very, in a very sophisticated, in a very uh, sort of high culture way, marginalizing Israel and now even our people. The fact that he wouldn't appear on a show with another scholar is staggering. Okay. In his article in the Huffington Post, he said that those who are denouncing the boycott movement, those who are critical of the American um, the ASA, are basically ignorant. So can you imagine, a scholar won't appear to debate me, and he's calling everybody who's opposed to the ASA boycott ignorant. Imagine. He won't debate, and anybody who opposes his views, he's considering ignorant. And I think 
the fact that in his article he talks about how Israelis are, are doing incursions into Gaza or in some cases actually interfering with education in Gaza during, during incursions. He, like others, do not place the issue into context. And the context is in Gaza, Hamas, for example, or in Lebanon, and in Syria, in, in Egypt, in Iran. We have the rise of a radical Islamist social movement and organizations in the Sunni and the Shiite world, which is using, and I'm choosing my words very carefully, a form of genocidal anti-Semitism. There's an incitement to exterminate 8 million Jews living in the Middle East. And the fact that we in the West are silent and allow these agents to operate in the United States and in Western Europe and, and is taking this horrific form of anti-Semitism and dehumanization of Israel and now taking it mainstream is a serious problem that not only that the Jewish community needs to wake up, but people who care about human rights have to wake up. Why is it that, professor, that people like this professor will demonize Israel but when over 125,000 Syrians are being liquidated, as we speak, by Iranian-backed regimes, when there's millions of refugees in Syria, when the Muslim Brotherhood is, sending, is, is setting fires at universities in, in Egypt, why is it that the ASA doesn't even mention this, never mind calling for a boycott? How is that possible? How is it possible that there's an American Studies Association meeting taking place today in which the American philosopher Judith Butler is speaking at the American University in Beirut, in Beirut, where Hezbollah is operating, backing the Iranian revolutionary regime, killing Syrians and threatening to exterminate Jews. How is this possible? How is this possible? Well, first of all, Charles, it is so important to have your input here, and you say it so eloquently, and I'm very, very grateful. I. We're not face-to-face. -face. We're on the telephone, and sometimes if one is face-to-face, -face, one can you know, say, excuse me, let me just interrupt for one moment. It's harder for me sure. to interrupt Sorry. when we're on the telephone. So you, you said two things, and you said them consecutively. The second to me was very, very important for our audience to hear, and again, it speaks to the extent to which there are so gross, horrific abuses of a such much more serious nature and much more a, a, a nature that, that destroys the human ability to simply live. And your, your discussion of how there is a genocidal campaign is very, very important. You added that, however, to a comment you made, in essence, gently criticizing me. And I want to come back at you with that because I want to use your word, and I, what I'm trying to do here is make the discussion and the way in which we as American Jews look at this ASA boycott. I want it to be clear what we are facing. I am not giving a professor at Stanford, Palumbo, any pass. He does not get a pass from me because he's a nice individual, and if that's what you thought I was saying, I want to clarify what I was saying. What I was saying was that part of what we, Jews, American Jewry, and Israeli Jews have to understand is that there is a, there is a group that is seriously anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitic means they hate Jews. And their criticism of Israel, from my perspective, is veiled anti-Semitism. And they will criticize Israel for things they will not criticize any other country for. And they are doing it because they hate Jews and don't want to see the state of Israel exist. And there must be one strategy against that kind of insidious hatred. But, Charles, from my perspective, there's another equally very dangerous but real enemy that the American Jew and the Israeli Jew has to understand exists. It's not the anti-Semite. It's the lovely liberal who isn't doing it because he comes with some kind of predisposition to be anti-Jewish. It's because he is, I use the word again, seduced. And he becomes part of the real problem. But how you deal with that issue is, in my mind, 
different from how you deal with the legitimate, the real, the bona fide anti-Semite. And I was asking you whether you feel now that I've clarified myself. Do you still think I'm wrong in making a distinction, not in quality, although quality also is involved, but in what strategy those who understand the plight Israel is in and the extraordinary job it's done bending over backwards with at least one arm tied behind its back, that we have to understand there are two different constituencies we have to address, the legitimate anti-Semite and the sort of the uneducated liberal guy who is going along and, and becomes the problem, but out of a very different motivation and a different context. Do you feel I am wrong there? Um, I don't feel that you're wrong, but I'll say this. I know that in Jewish ethics, which I think is the, a tremendous amount of wisdom in Jewish thought and ethics, that we're supposed to judge people's actions. We don't necessarily know, or it's maybe not even necessarily worthy to look what's in somebody's heart, but we judge their actions. And sometimes, if somebody is motivated uh, consciously to do a sin, the, the punishment could be more harsh than if somebody does something uh, that is unintentional. But we still judge the action. And if people are wittingly or unwittingly engaged in forms of dehumanizing Jews in 2014, I think they need to be treated uh, appropriately. And I think it, it's also a question of leadership, that we can't uh, remain silent when countries in the West um, separate economic and political and geostrategic interests from human rights. And when the, the P5 plus 1 countries sign this interim agreement with Iran, whether it's worthy or not to do this is another story. But when the leader of Iran rants and raves about how Jews and Zionists and Israelis are dogs and will be obliterated, and when the leading countries of leading six countries of the Western world within less than 24 hours not only remain silent but in, engage in, to, in this interim agreement, I think it sends a very very dangerous message not just in relation to the future of the Jews and anti-Semitism, but basic notions of human rights and an international um, you know, structure of moral and international law. And this is creating, I think, an atmosphere, if you will, that is filtering down into our societies, into our important institutions, i.e. universities and even the media. Yes. And I think people who are concerned about anti-Semitism, uh, hatred, what's going on in places like Syria and Iran and Lebanon, and now certainly throughout the Middle East, that we have to take a very strong and moral position. And if people are wittingly or unwittingly uh, participating in supporting these reactionary forces, I think we need to take a very clear and informed stand. And what professor, this professor from Stanford University, I feel whether he's doing it intentionally or not, is, you know, participating in a, a changing mood in the United States, in our important institutions, that is dangerous for the Jewish people, and it's dangerous for basic human rights and international law. Boya, I agree with you a thousand percent, and it's what really is so troubling about the ASA boycott. It was interesting for me, I, I'm, I'm only repeating myself here, whether one does something out of ignorance or malice, to me, makes a difference. You are correct. We are really concerned with the effect of the action. But how one counters ignorance is different than one how, how one counters malevolence. And it was interesting, Charles, I mentioned to the professor that Omar Barghouti, who was the founding committee member of the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, the founder of the boycott movement within the Palestinian community in, uh, against Israel. This guy is currently studying for a master's degree in philosophy at Tel Aviv University. And I said that to Professor Balumbo and he was taken aback by it. And my own feeling is 
that one of the things people like you and one of the things we have to do here at Shalom TV and some of the outstanding people like Shahar Azani at the Israeli consulate here in New York and the consul general himself, it's necessary for us to understand that we must give people information who are at the moment not opposing us out of some kind of deep hatred of Jews, but because they don't know better. And our responsibility, your responsibility, Charles, is to speak to colleagues and make sure that the truth, to the extent to which it is possible to get the truth through to people who are closed, and you know, the fact that he would not come on with you indicates a certain kind of closure that just troubles me as it troubles you. But the, the difference between dealing with somebody who is ignorant as opposed to somebody is, who is malevolent to me is a very important distinction which we must keep in mind as we try to fight the fight you're leading us in when it comes to the academic community. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly with you. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is to organize the funding for a, a serious and major research project on the origin and the, the, the forces behind the BDS movement, the boycott movement. And this boycott movement goes back to the Soviet time and to the Gulf states in the 60s and 70s that were trying to boycott Israel. We in the West seem to be reacting to the ASA and to sort of the symptoms of the problems, but this is part of a, a propaganda war that we also need to understand who is funding it, who's buying chairs in universities, what are the implications of Al Jazeera operating in the United States and in other, uh, buying other uh, media outlets in, in the West. We really need to understand who we're dealing with and how this is being manifested in the public discourse and how it's affecting us. I think. We need to look at, at this issue in a more structural way and not just reacting to the symptoms of the problem. I That's agree with important. you. I want to squeeze in one more question, Charles, and for, there be, there's no better person for me to ask than you. In some way, this ASA boycott represents a new phenomenon on the American scene. Can you speak about what you feel the ASA boycott represents in a larger sense and what it suggests to you about the future of the BDS movement's success or lack of success on the, on the American scene? So again, I think we need to look, I would argue, we need to look at who is this enemy and what is this enemy? Who are the conveyors of this message to demonize Israel in our universities, in our most important media outlets? We have to know who's funding it, who's behind it, and how it's being manifested and how it affects us. We, we don't know. That's number one. And number two, I would say that we have to really, I think, take a very strong stand on anti-Semitism and stop debating if anti-Semitism is this or it's not that and it may be this and it may be that. And we have to, in a sense, I think, be very proud and strong and take a, a strong position against all forms of hatred, including anti-Semitism. And I, I would say respectfully, there I don't, I don't think that you would host somebody who wouldn't appear with an African-American or a woman or a gay person. And yet, we in our community are somehow handcuffed to take strong positions against, against people like your former guest who wouldn't even appear with somebody with a different perspective, mm -hmm. a Jewish perspective, defending the right to, of Israel to exist. Not all of its policies, but the right for Jewish self-determination in Israel. And I think that we have to educate ourselves to be strong and to stand up for true human rights, democratic values, and citizenship, and to question leading people who claim to be liberal but are really backing the most reactionary forces on the planet today. How can people write, like Peter Beinhardt and uh, Mr. Friedman in the New York Times, write sympathetic pieces to the Iranian regime? or to Hamas, or Hezbollah, or the Brotherhood, and claim to be liberal. This is anti-liberal to support a reactionary movement such as this. And, we, and true liberals, people who care about human rights for all people, and strong citizenship for all people under one legal system, I think we need, our voices need to be heard, and we shouldn't be ashamed or afraid to stand up. 
Charles, is this a new phenomenon on the American scene? I think the atmosphere in the United States is shifting. And the fact that foreign policy in Europe and, and in the United States now seems to be policy is, foreign policy is being decoupled from human rights, from anti-Semitism in this case. I think the atmosphere is changing and that we who care about American values, democratic values, and, and stopping various forms of hatred need to speak out clearly against this. So yes, I think this wave is coming from the Middle East. It, it, I think the United States is perhaps 10 or 15 years behind Europe. Europe has been experiencing this type of atmospherics, if you will, for the last decade or two, and it's now has arrived on the shores of the United States, and we need to understand what it is and, and find out effective means to expose it, to name it, and to fight it. Charles, I love speaking with you. I miss you. When you come back to the States, you have to come and sit in studio with me. I wish you called Tuba Hatzlacha. You are doing extraordinary work on behalf of world Jewry and the State of Israel. And I wish you continued success in every endeavor. I will see you very soon, my friend. I look forward to it. Thank you so much for having me, and all the best to you and your colleagues. Thank you so much. Thanks. The thoughts of Charles Small, the founding executive director of ISCAP, the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy, and one of the extraordinary people on the world you were seeing. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have including whether you think I'm being naive when I in some way make a distinction between the kinds of people who are anti-Israel because they are ignorant or those who are anti-Israel and anti-Semitic because they really hate Jews. Again, my address, please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Thank you.